if you learn the skills to have conversational excellence, relationship excellence, connection excellence, and no matter what your story is, no matter how much you were abused, no matter how much trauma there was, you can turn it all around. I'm living proof of that. of Americans identify as not very happy, which can hold you back and negatively affect your relationships and your business. On this podcast, we discuss the proven steps to happiness so you can restore balance and rekindle your joy. Welcome to another episode of How to Be Happier for Entrepreneurs. Today is going to be fun. Our guest today is Larry Hagner. Larry, how the heck are you? Brad, I'm doing great, man. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. You're welcome. So we've got so you do some really cool stuff, and I know you help a lot of people. We're going to talk a lot about that today. But just give us the 30 second or the 60 second version of who is Larry and what exactly do you do? Oh boy. Uh, so first and foremost, I'm a dad and I'm a husband. Uh, married to my soulmate, my wonderful wife, Jessica. We've been married for 21 years, so we can like legally drink as a couple now. That's a terrible dad joke, by the way. And uh, I have four boys, uh, 18, 16, 8, and 10. I say things out loud to these human beings I never thought I'd say out loud to anybody. Like, can you please put some pants on before you come to the dinner table? Or why is there a half-eaten peanut butter and jelly sandwich on the sink of my bathroom? I'm not even kidding that those are the things I've actually said. Um What do I do? Uh, I am the host and founder, uh, I guess, chief facilitator of the Dad Edge podcast and the the Dad Edge Alliance, which is our mastermind community for men, husbands and fathers. Um, Been doing this now for almost 10 years. And um, I basically help men transform their relationships under their own roof, the relationship with themselves, the relationship with their wives, the connection with their kids. The whole nine yards. Um, the last thing I'll say is uh, when it comes to our lives, our lives are shorter than we can possibly imagine, right? And there are a lot of people, some of some of the, the best ideas and the biggest regrets are buried in graveyards uh, across the world, right? My goal for every man who works with me, every man who works within Dad Edge and our ecosystem, I don't care if you're here for a week, I don't care if you're with me for 10 years. It is you are on your deathbed with a smile. You're, you're surrounded by family and all you're doing is telling funny stories about how you all connected, how you live life relentlessly and fulfilling, how you had the best marriage on the planet, how you had the best connection with your kids. That is my goal for every guy who works with me. I love it. So you, you've you mentioned several times the word connection. Doesn't everything start with the connection that an individual has with themselves? A thousand percent. <laughs> Isn't that missing, though, from so many marriage counseling and life coaching and psychiatry practices? Isn't isn't that like it's just kind of missing, right? I, I, I think that's I, I think it is missing. I think if um, I think the majority of the things that we pursue on a daily basis are not the things that are going to be spoken about at our funeral. Right. Because if you if you go to anybody's funeral, it was never how much time they spent in the workplace. It was never. um you know, how much money they had in their bank accounts. It was all about the impact that they had on other people. And in order to make an impact on on other people, you've got to be connected to your most authentic self. Man, I knew I was going to love you. Like you're speaking my language. I know this, unfortunately, this episode is only going to be 30 or 35 minutes, but I know you and I could probably speak for like 48 hours if we had some Cokes or something or some Mountain Dew. So, so um, I'm guessing you weren't always this way. So tell us about your early family experiences and how they influenced your career and this life coaching philosophy that you uh, impart on so many people now. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I don't want to fool anybody. Um, all my dirty laundry is out there for 10 years of podcasting. Um, do I know more than I used to? Absolutely. Am I a perfect father? Not even close. <laughs> like my, my kids will tell you that. Am I a perfect husband? My wife will tell you all of our dirty laundry. Like it's just, but, but here's the cool thing. Um, I've been married for 21 years. The first 10 years was not good. I mean, 
had I not done dad edge and gotten out of my own way and started learning this stuff. Cause that's really where this all came from is like, I just want to learn it. I just want to be a better husband. I want to be a better father. I want to have these connected relationships. I just don't know how the hell to do it. Um, that's when I started to learn, but I will tell you, like, I still make mistakes every single day. Um, I still say things I don't mean. I still do things I don't want to do. Um, the difference is, is I'm much more aware of these things when they happen. And, you know, life is full of peaks and valleys. And what I can tell you is the biggest difference that this has made, I, and it's been for me, it's been for guys who have worked with us, is the valleys are much shorter and the peaks are much longer. And usually you can avoid a valley by being much more aware of what about what is about to happen or what's about ready to not happen. And you can get in front of things faster and you can recover faster. But yeah, this really came like my childhood was not pretty, man. It was uh, it was really, really crazy. Um, I'm happy to share it with you. I don't want to take too much time. So I'll, I'll just ask for your permission. If you want to hear it, I'll, I'll... Yeah, dude, give, give us give us I, I want to hear it because I think this is really important to for people yeah. to understand that no matter where you come from, that you can turn things around in a, in a profound way. And, and I th that's that's exactly what I would I would double down on. Right. So many people and I used to be the same way. I can't have the life that I want. I can't have the marriage that I want. I can't have the connection with my kids that I want. I can't have the body that I want, the finances that I want, all these things, right? Because of where I came from, right? I had all these horrible experiences, all this trauma or whatever else growing up. So it's not even in the cards for me. It's not even possible. And I will tell you, that's the biggest lie, man, that we tell ourselves. And I lied to myself. I believed that story for so many years, man. My story is this. So my mom and biological father got married in 1971. They had me in 1975. They got married very, very young. They were 21 years old. Um, both of them came from childhoods that were a bit of a mess. So they came in with their own trauma. Um, nine months after I was born, my mom and dad divorced. It was a very ugly divorce. My dad was out. I have no recollection of my biological father being a part of my life whatsoever when I was little. I actually didn't even really realize what a dad was until I was four because it was just me and my mom and I was in preschool. And uh, I remember dads would come and pick up their kids from school. And I knew what a dad was and I knew we didn't have one at home, but I wasn't upset about it or anything like that. I thought moms go out and find dads. Like literally that's what I thought. Like I was like, well, I guess my mom hasn't found my dad yet. That's okay. And I'll, I'll never forget being four years old. There's a funny story. And my mom pulls me aside one day and she's like, Hey, um, I'm having a friend of mine over for dinner tonight. He's a very special friend and I've known him for a little bit and I really want you to meet him. That was her way of telling me I've been dating somebody I worked with and it's time for you to meet him. So I was like, I heard the word he, and I was like, Oh my God, like this is a dude coming over. Like this is the dad, like this is probably the dad. Right. And this guy comes walking in my house. I'll never forget it. Never, I, I've never seen a man walk in my house and he's wearing a trench coat, three piece suit, had a handlebar mustache, the feathered hair, briefcase. He was a white collar data software engineer. And this guy walks in and he shook my hand. And the first thing I said, looking up at him, I said, are you going to be my dad? Like, oh my God. <laughs> that was the first thing, man. <laughs> that's, and, a, that's what every guy wants to hear on a first date. Meeting. Oh my God. <laughs> it was so funny, man. I literally remember, I think my mom gasped. Like I heard her, like, she's like, Oh my God. Like, yeah. And then he like awkwardly laughed, but like six months later they got married and um, he adopted me. So my last name wow. still to this day is his last name. Wow. Yeah. And I would dude, it was amazing. Like that first year I was like, this is awesome. Like family, like here's my dad. Like we've been waiting for him. Right. Cause I didn't know about the birds and the bees and it was cool. He was a weekend dad. He traveled a ton for work. So I didn't get a chance to see him that much. Um, but um, it was good in the beginning. And then they were married for six years and every year got progressively worse. Uh, he's an alcoholic. So was my mom. So they fought really bad. He was very abusive. He had a horrible anger streak to him. I mean, he would throw me on the ground. He would strangle me. He'd hit me. I got punched. So did my mom. Um, it was a horrible thing up until the age of 10. They got divorced. And then I've never seen him since. I found out about 10 years ago he died. Um, I had never seen him since it was really weird, but I started asking a lot of questions when I was 10. I was like, what? cause I knew about the birds and the bees. I was like, wait a second. I was like, this dude came into my life at four. Like, who's my dad? So I asked my mom, I'm like, where did I come from? And she was like, 
I was actually married before. And I was like, what? I had no idea. She's like, yeah, you have a biological father. I was like, what's his name? Like, what does he look like? Where's he at? And she's like, I don't know where he's at. She's like, but here are the wedding albums. You know, here's what he looks like. And two years go by and I won't go into detail because it's just too long of a story. But serendipitously, I met him by accident. It wasn't planned. Wow. Yeah, it was crazy. And, but he only lived three miles from us. And I saw my dad every week at, for, for six months. He was remarried at the time, had a two-year-old son, another one on the way. But dude, I was so excited to have my own dad in my life. He came to my Little League games. We hung out every week. I spent time with his family. Called him dad right away. And after about six months, I started to get this feeling like something was wrong. Like it was just this feeling like he was quieter. He was distant, kind of cold. And I couldn't figure it out. And I remember being 12 years old and I remember picking up the phone one day and I just was like, you know, Hey, like, like, is there anything going on? Like, I don't, I don't see you as much. We don't talk as much. Like, I feel like when I'm around you, something's wrong. And he's like, basically he said, it's me. It's not you. I can't do this. And I was devastated, devastated. Uh, got it really depressed. Um, I failed the eighth grade. I had to do eighth grade twice. Um, got really fat. Um, ate, ate my feelings away. Turned things around that second year of eighth grade. Um, went on to high school. My mom continued to date and marry like these horrible, abusive men. It was a revolving door of abusive men. Some guys would stay a month. Some guys would t stay two years. But they were all the same dudes. And it was constant abuse, constant alcoholism. It was horrible. Went on to high school, went on to college, got my degree, got into medical device sales, super lucrative career, married my college sweetheart, 30 years old, expecting our first son. And another very, very serendipitous thing happened. I'm in a Starbucks in St. Louis, 30 years old, married two years, first son on the way. I was there for a business meeting. A guy walks in, caught my eye, I looked up, and it was my father. The one, the one I hadn't seen since I was 12. And one of the coworkers that was with me, I was also very good friends with her. She knew that story and she saw the look on my face and she's like, are you okay? Like, you look like you've just seen a ghost. And I was like, I'm pretty sure I did. I was like, cause my father's in here. And she's like, are, wait, what are you serious? I'm like, yeah. She's like, oh my God, where is he? And I was like, he's right over there. He was sitting at a table. She's like, oh, my God, what are you going to do? What are you going to say? And I'm like, I'm not going to do or say anything. She's like, what, you, you're going gonna, to gonna let him walk out of here? I'm like, yeah, he's never been a part of my life. I'm not. There's no reason now. So she just took it upon herself to get up and walk over. And she sat at his table. And I was like, what is about to happen? Like, what is going on? And so they talked for like a minute. He scanned the room. Our eyes met. And I was like. Oh my God, what is about to happen? And he stood up very humbly, walked over, extended his hand. He's like, you know, hey, like, man, it's like, how are you doing? And I'm like, fine. How are you? So I wasn't nice, but I wasn't a complete jerk. I was somewhat in between. But he was like, you know, we talked for a few minutes. He's like, man, we should really get together. And I think I said something along the lines of like, look, you don't have to do this. You, you don't have to do this. He's like, no, 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 I, I, I want to. And I was like, well, here's my card. It was 2005, so smartphones were not. Like, well, here's my card. I was like, you want to get together? It's on you. And I got an email from him a couple of days later, and it was, it was a huge email, and it was very heartfelt. Basically, like all the regret that my dad had been harboring. Wow. He asked me. He's like, can we please go out to breakfast? And my, I make my dad sound like a loser. He's not. He's a very successful entrepreneur, very well respected in our community. Um, he's been married for 45 years to the same wonderful woman. I have two younger half brothers that are absolutely awesome. Um, it was just a guy who made a bad decision. That's it. And we ended up talking and here we are 19 years later and we still got a great relationship. And my two younger half brother, my youngest brother and I get along unbelievably. We're unbelievably tight. And my, my kids know him as grandpa and grandma and everything's been good. But dad edge got started with a really, really bad, dark moment. My oldest son was six. My youngest was four at the time. He's now 16. Out of rage, I spanked him. I promised myself when I got married, I would never hit my children out of anger. 
as that was the first and the last time I ever did it, but I spanked him so hard he hit the ground. I actually made my son fall. Wow. And I realized in the moment exactly what I did. I went to go help him up and he looked at me. And when I went, extended my hands to pick him up, he closed his eyes and did this. It was almost like I was a monster. Wow. And it was in that moment, Brad, that I was like, no more. Not on my watch. Like my marriage is terrible. It's, it's struggling. Like I am barely breathing in my marriage and so is my wife. My kids, I'm not connected to them. I'm not a patient father. Like, I'm like literally winging this. Like, could there be a better way? Could I learn how to do this? Are there skills that I could learn to do this? And I went on a journey, man, at, in 2011, and I haven't stopped since. And it has been absolutely true. If you learn the skills to have conversational excellence, relationship excellence, connection excellence, like you can, no matter what your story is, no matter how much you were abused, no matter how much trauma there was, you can turn it all around. And I'm, I'm living proof of that. Guys who've done life with us, living proof of that. But it takes effort, man. And it is some of it is not fun. Yeah. Wow. What a story, Larry. I mean, I'm hearing this for the first time. That is really, really powerful. Um, I know a uh, someone who had an affair with someone and had a child. And he screwed up and the wife found out. And then when the wife found out, she was like, you can't have a relationship with that child. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know if that was your, if, if, if your stepmother or his wife had any, anything to do with it, but um, that's really interesting. Um, gosh, you said so, so many freaking interesting things. How, how, how could you have been any different is, is one question. Like people look at you and they may judge you and you hit your kid and you were disconnected and you had the shitty marriage. Well, no shit. Like you went through the worst of the worst. You, you, your father abandoned you at a very young age, come back into your life when you can actually, you have a mind that has logic and then he dumps you again. Like <laughs> how could you have been any different, my friend? Right. I mean, I, I, I appreciate that perspective, but I, I'll tell you, um, I have no patience for that perspective anymore. And I, and I mean that in a kind way, um, meaning like we can't help where we came from. Right. We can't help the trauma that we might have experienced. I mean, my kids are going to grow up with their own bag of tricks that I that, that I passed on to them. I, I, I it doesn't matter how grave a father we are. All of us will have a father wound of some sort. Right. It just depends on how deep it goes and how horrible it is. The, the reason I, I don't I don't necessarily buy into that of like, well, how different could you have been? Well, you know what? It's my responsibility. If I want different, I got to do different. Right. I can't I can't buy into that story of like, well, I, this this isn't in the cards for me. I did that because of how I was raised. No, no, it's it's actually my responsibility to be different and to be that change. And if I'm not willing to take on that responsibility, well, I'm going to pay that very dear price of probably losing my family. Right. So that story can serve us to give us fuel to be like, not on my watch, man. So, or it can, it can absolutely disserve us by that's our excuse for us buying into it. Yeah. So everything you just said, which was a counterpoint argument to mine, I agree with you. But let me put it in a different perspective. And maybe I didn't articulate what I was really trying to say is my father hit me. He spanked me. He made fun of me constantly. So I decided not to be that father. And I had never once laid a hand on either of my children. And now they're, they're both turning one turning 22 and one turning 17 at the end of the month. Here's, here's what I, the point I was trying to make is that while I didn't hit them, I couldn't give them what they really needed because I thought I wasn't enough given what I grew up with. And I didn't have the awareness. I didn't have the awareness. And it wasn't until age 47 that I had an awareness that I reconnected with myself. And now I've been able to reconnect with them and everything in my life has changed. So I don't, I don't make an excuse. Like you hit your child. It isn't. It, I wasn't trying to say that you should hit your child. I was just trying to say, until you have awareness, how could you be any different? So anyway, amazing stuff. So you now teach this. You help transform people's lives. I love to give like, you know, lots of nuggets on this, on this podcast. What are some things that families can do? Communication strategies, like a connection strategies to help marriages and help family relationships. That's a great question. So, you know, in our community, we teach several of these, right? Just in marriage alone, um, I teach 12 of these things, right? Communication, connection, conversational excellence, all of these things. 
in order for you to, I, I think what's most important is, is you have to understand what the needs are of the people in your life. Because if you don't know what the needs are, then the tactics will fall short and the skills will fall short because you don't even know what the heck you're doing or what need you're fulfilling. So um, I think if most married couples or most human beings knew the information that I'll share with you, I think relationships would be a lot better because people would know what the perspective is. So your wife, right? Um, the woman in your life for all the husbands out there, she has three basic needs. And I'm not talking about food, water, shelter and clothing and all that stuff. I'm talking about relationship needs. What does she need from you? A woman in your life needs to feel seen. She needs to feel heard. And she needs to feel safe. Now, here's the good news for husbands and fathers. Your kids, boy or girl, doesn't matter. Age, doesn't matter. They have the exact same needs to feel seen, to feel heard, and to feel safe. If a dad can fulfill those needs with a kid, those kids feel really fantastic about dad. If he can fulfill those needs for his wife, ooh, she feels pretty good about you. Now, our basic needs, our three basic needs in relationships as men is to feel respected, appreciated, and validated. So um, now that we kind of know the three basic needs, it's like, okay, well, what do I do with that? How do I do that? So um, let me just share the difference between men and women really quickly. So like, Brad, you're a man, I'm a man, right? So if I were to come to you and say, hey, Brad, like, I'm really struggling lately with um, just trying to be happy and content with life. I, I feel like I'm in a season where I'm challenged. I have some anxiety. I'm depressed. And I'm going off of the name of obviously, you know, your podcast and movement. Um, and if you were to sit there and be like, man, that sounds really tough. I'd probably be like, well, Brad, well, well what the hell do you think I should do about it? Right. Like, because I'm coming to you as a man because I want advice. Right. I want you to point me in the right direction. Yeah. That's not, that's, but that's not the way the women in our lives are wired. Sometimes they want that, but most of the time they don't. And our kids are the same way. The best thing that we could possibly do when it comes to communication to make them feel seen and heard is to become a master at validation. And the good news about validation is you don't have to solve a thing. All you have to do is be a really, really good listener, reflect back what you think that person's feeling, right? So I'll give you, I'll give you an example of this and then a bad example of this. I'll give you the bad example first. So I used to actually do this. This is how much of a jerk I was and how much of an idiot I was. I would come home. My wife would tell me about her day. And let's just say it was an overwhelming day. Like, hey, like, hey, sweetheart, how was your day? Oh, my God, today was terrible. Like Colton spilled his milk, shattered a glass all over the, you know, all over the floor. You know, Lawson is sick. Um, I just got a medical bill in the mail and it's twelve hundred dollars like and I would immediately, he upon hearing that, I'd be like, well, that's not such a big deal. Like, you know, it looks like the milk is cleaned up and it looks like, you know, and L loss will be okay. And, and we'll just, we'll figure out a way to pay the bill. It's not that big of a deal. And my wife would look at me and be like, are, are you even listening to me? I'm like, of course I am. I just heard every word you just said. Like, and I just, and I'm sitting here thinking like, and I just gave you the solutions or the advice of what we could do to make this right. And I could not figure out for the life of me, like why we weren't connecting. Well, then I realized that number one, my wife had already thought of those things, right? But when we start just giving out advice like that, the message that it's kind of crazy, the message that we're actually sending is, I don't trust you enough to figure this out on your own. And I'm gonna have to come to your rescue. The other thing too, that it sends a message to is that the other person's like, I don't think you're listening because all you were doing was thinking about solutions the whole time I was talking. So it, it, that whole strategy of us giving advice and fixing things falls really flat with the women and in, in our kids in our lives. The best thing you can possibly do, I know it sounds oversimplified, is validate what they're feeling, right? And by the way, you don't have to agree with how they're feeling or how they're handling it. All you have to do is try to identify what they're feeling. Oh, now if my wife tells me that, I'll say something like, that sounds really frustrating. Like I, I can I can definitely understand why you're frustrated. In fact, I can't even imagine somebody that wouldn't be frustrated with with that. Like, so t tell me more. Tell me more about what's going on. And she'll just keep talking. But by me saying what I think that she's feeling, which is frustrated or overwhelmed or whatever else, 
and then normalizing it by saying like, man, anybody in your shoes would be really frustrated. Right. Uh, and when I say, tell me more, that's an invite for them to tell me more. But if I say, why do you feel that way? If I insert that three letter word, why do you feel that way? That feels accusatory and she's probably going to shut down and not feel connected to you and not feel safe. But the tell me more is like, come on, bring it in. What, what else you got? Let's hear it. Right. And if I'm ever confused about what my wife actually really needs, sometimes I'll just ask and I'll just say, Hey, you know, I just want to make sure that I'm the best support for you right now. And if that's listening, I'm all in, like, I'll listen as long as you want to talk. But if you also want to, if you want to talk about solutions, like we can talk about that too. What, what feels best to you? And my wife will tell me, she'll be like, I just need you to listen. Okay, great. Now I know what to do. Or she'll be like, I really want to talk solutions. Awesome. I'm a guy, so we can talk about that too. But when you do that, people suddenly feel like you're the most comfortable person in the world to talk to because they feel seen, they feel heard. They know that, that you actually see what it is that they're feeling. You actually feel what they feel. And that's how, pe that's how human beings connect. And that's intimacy, right, at the highest level. But that's how you have to operate. With, with your wives and your kids. The kids the same way, right? I love to ask my kids, even, even if they're 10, and I know the solution off the top of my head. Sometimes I'll just be like, well, what do you think would be the best move right now? Or what, what, would, what would make you, if we were to fast forward a week from now and this whole issue is solved, what did you do, right? And I put them in the driver's seat just by asking them really good questions, you know, to get them to state what they're going to do. Yeah, the word what is, all, is oftentimes better than the word why. Why did you do that? as opposed to what caused you. Why do you think so many marriages are in turmoil, relationships and marriages, and what can be done to, to turn the tide? So I, I think, number one, number one, marriage is a two-way street, right? Um, I coach a lot of men. And the, the good news is, is the, the coaching has been very, very effective because a man is a leader, right? If a man is leading in a way and he's living in such a way and he's operating in such a way, well, that's going to be contagious for the other people around him, right? Kids and wives. But I think the biggest thing that we have to do is change our perspective. Marriages are in turmoil because, quite frankly, most people, and I was one of them, refused to realize or even know that there are skills to being a really happy, content, married person. Right. Um, take someone who does Brazilian, who, who's an MMA fighter. Right. You go to training to learn how to do that. You don't just jump into the octagon with Frankie Edgar or Conor McGregor because you feel like, hey, I think I'm going to go be a UFC fighter today. You go train for years to learn the skills. You learn Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. You learn striking. You learn how to defend yourself. You learn all of these things. If you want to be a firefighter, you got to go learn how to be a firefighter. You want to be a cop, you got to go be a cop. I just learned this. To be a barber, you need 900 hours of experience before you graduate barber college. That's more than a real estate agent. <laughs> right, I know. Real estate agent, same thing. So, you know, but when we get married, we walk down the aisle, we say, I do. And like, don't worry, man, you'll figure it out. Best time of your whole life. That is horrible. That's a horrible perspective because it's disastrous. The divorce rate's 50%. What's really terrifying, though, just more to your story, the couples that stay together, only one third of couples can actually identify their marriage as fulfilling and working. The other two thirds, it's either they're either settled or they're on the way to divorce. I've heard, I've heard, I've heard 3%. My, my mom has a friend named David Knox, who's a psychologist who wrote a book 30 years ago. And he said 3%. And can you believe this? Tuesday afternoon, I'm getting a massage and I'm talking to my massage therapist. We're getting these deep conversations. I go, how many clients do you have? He goes, 388. Okay. I said, okay, let's round up to 400. I go, how many, um, how many uh, clients of those are in really good relationships? He thinks for a minute. And he goes, 12. I go, do you know what percent is? I go, that's crazy. You just said 3%. That was the exact same thing this guy. She's, he's like, you got to give me this book. So anyway, it's just interesting. Not many is, is look around the world. Not many are in great relationships. They're all complaining about something. They, they are. And I'm not saying that even a great relationship is complaint free, right? But I will tell you this, the cup, that 3%, the yeah. common ground that sets them apart from anything else, 
they go learn marriage jujitsu. They go learn marriage striking. That's a really bad analogy. But they go get, they learn the skills to communicate with each other, right? They don't leave it to chance. They go and learn like, hey, how do I best communicate with my wife? What does she need? What do I need? How do I communicate my needs, right? How do I have conversations with my wife where we vet out all of our expectations with each other? You know, the, the, the silent killer of relationships is this, emotional resentment. And a lot of it stems from expectations that are set out loud that aren't fulfilled or quiet expectations that are never set out loud. And then the person starts to feel resentment and then they start to feel sadness. Once you get to the emotion of disgust where that significant other disgusts you, it's, you're pr- it's pretty said. much over. That's what yeah. Gottman, Gottman said. Um, one of the, he's probably the foremost marriage counselor in the world now. He's right. books. He was like, I, I, I will look at the first 15 minutes of a conversation when they come into my office. He used the word contempt, which is pretty much the same thing. If there's contempt, yeah. 95% chance they're done within five years. You So, so the marriage jujitsu, people have to learn those skills. But Larry, I don't believe you can learn all the skills that you want. And you may be the best in the world at teaching them. But if you don't have connection with yourself and you feel not enough, it is near impossible to execute on those skills because I did it in two marriages. And it, it didn't work. It doesn't. You know, you, you've got to start with that man in the mirror. Right. Like, um, and I'll share this with you, right? Like I have guys that come in to our ecosystem and they want, they want marriage coaching. And what I tell them is like, they, they're doing it for this external thing, right. For, because I want her to respond to me. Right. And I always tell the guys, I was like, we'll get there, but we need to start with you. We need to change this and we need to change this and we need to change your perspective of you. Like I'm working with a guy right now, like I, and he was a little apprehensive to work with me, but his wife is like, I'm out, I'm done. Like, unfortunately I think she's in that disgust mode, but this guy has been a chronic, like literally this guy sat on a call with me for 40 minutes telling me all the things that he says he's going to do and he doesn't do them. He's like, Larry, I'm a starter and I'm, I'm not a finisher. Like my wife will tell you that I am not a man of my word and I, I get a really good idea and then I start to do it and then I don't do it. And I looked straight at him. And I, by the way, I'm one of the most empathetic, compassionate, like I'll meet you where you're at. I'm also going to hold you to the fire. And I, I asked this, I told this, I asked this guy, I said, Hey, I, I need permission to speak very directly with you. Is that okay? He said, yeah, that's okay. I was like, let me tell you something. That story that you just told yourself that you just told me, we need to change that first because you're buying into all of this. And because you're buying into it, you're operating like this. And that's why you're getting the results that you want. I know you want to learn all these things to turn your marriage around. We got to turn you around first. Like that is number one. We're going to spend significant time rewiring this 1.0 version of you into a 2.0 version of you where you are a starter and a finisher. You are a man of your word. If you say something out loud that you're going to do, come hell or high water, you are going to do it, period, yeah. right? And he, I was like, we can make all the changes in the world, but if you don't believe that, it's going to be all for nothing. So that is going to be the first thing. He's like, and he told me, he's like, I don't know if I can change. I've been this way my whole life. I was like, then we probably shouldn't work together. Yeah. You know? If, if you're in a, a failing marriage, whether you come to Larry or myself or someone else, you have got to heal yourself because that's the only prayer you have of healing that marriage. There's no counseling. There's no, if you don't heal those wounds from your past, oh my Lord, it's, it's going to be a really, really, really tough battle. So Great. I want to end by um, talking about how we can find you. But before I do that, I just want to tell the listeners, if you're sitting there thinking, do I have some of these childhood things that are affecting my relationship, my health, my business, do yourself and your family, and if you have a business, your business a favor, go take our self-love quiz at unlocklimitlessyou.com forward slash quiz. It only takes three minutes, and I promise you won't be disappointed. And no matter what results you get, always know that you can get better and you can change your life. So, Larry, this has been awesome. If people want to learn more about you, reach out to you, what is the best place to find you? Uh, you can. So I, I've, I've been podcasting for almost a decade. Um, I've got t- over 1,200 episodes of content. Um, 
So like they can start there with the podcast. It's the Dad Edge podcast. Our website's the dot uh, com. If if your marriage needs help, um, I've got a training. It's called uh, uh, 25 Intimate Conversation Starters. Just go to the dot com forward slash 25 questions. I, I, there's a there's a free 15 minute video where I teach you the psychology of asking the people that you love most in your life, your wife, your kids, really good, deep questions that will get you insanely connected to, to her or your kids. Um, just go to the dadage.com forward slash 25 questions for that. It also comes with a PDF of, um, of 25 questions that you can use right away. Um, I don't want a thing from you. I'm not trying to sell you a thing, but here's what I do want. You'll get some emails after you start doing that. I want you to reply to those emails. And I want you to tell me how things are going. All right. That is the payment back to me. Okay. Tell me how these questions are working. Right. Tell me the conversations you're having. I want to hear them. I get the best, most incredible responses from guys. Like guys will tell me, be like, dude, like I asked my wife, like, what is something I currently do that makes you feel most loved? And she started to cry. That's what I want to hear. Yeah, right? baby. That's, yeah. That's awesome. Well, the, uh, yeah, man, you're a light, you're shining light in this universe and, and, we're we're lucky to have you. So I appreciate your time. That was an awesome show. Your story is awesome. Keep uh, keep changing lives, my friend. Back at you, man. Thank you again. That concludes another episode of How to Be Happier for Entrepreneurs. Remember, I'm on a mission to help a million people, and I cannot do it alone. So please, if you like this content, share it, rate it, review it, whatever you can do to share this message. I'd be greatly appreciated. Until next time, love heals all. Hit subscribe if you don't want to miss out on more life-changing content. And if you're struggling, you don't have to. Go to bradchandler.com slash contact. There, you can join the Facebook community of like-minded entrepreneurs, and you'll see a button to schedule your freedom and happiness call. See you on the next episode.